Already a great day in God's house. Amen. Wow. I, I want to see the whole church look like that little section right up there. They are packed in up there if you can't see them, but we're going to get the whole church packed out like that. Now that we see the light at the end of this tunnel, it's good to have you home. Good to see you back. If you're visiting, welcome. If you're with us by streaming again, we're so grateful you are here. Our congregation is larger than we know. Uh, and I'm thankful for the many, many who go to our website and Facebook and YouTube pages and check out our services, not just live, but throughout the week. Grateful, we appreciate it, and we're thankful to have a touch in the world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. So as we come together today, we know God is going to bless us. Had a great worship service last week. Gwen and I took a, a Sunday away, and we were with you uh, by streaming ourselves and enjoyed the service. Pastor Jeffrey had a tremendous sermon. The worship service was wonderful, but I'm glad to be back here in the pulpit as well. I feel like this sermon today is kind of part B to Jeffrey's sermon, so we're going to jump right into it. I want you to take your Bible, turn with me to the Gospel of John, chapter 12, one more step forward in a marathon study through this amazing Word of God. The more I study it, the more amazing it becomes. And with this sermon, as we step into chapter 12, today, we're also stepping into the final week of Jesus' life before the cross of Calvary. He enters into Jerusalem on the back of a donkey, fulfilling the prophecy of Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9. And we're going to be covering quite a bit of Scripture today. When you open your Bible now, uh, whether it's here in the sanctuary or there at home or where you are today, keep it open through the sermon. I'm going to refer to it uh, several times. We're going to read it in pieces today. But I want us to go right to Jesus' words uh, and uh, see how He relates being a seed, how he relates, how his life is invested. Uh, We want to see him coming into Jerusalem for the last time. Of course, the city of Jerusalem, the name of the city is City of Shalom, City of Peace. And we're thankful that Jesus gave his life outside of that city so that you and I might have the peace of salvation. So we might have the comfort of knowing that we have an eternal home. And that invitation and that word is not just for a few people. It is for the world. Jesus Christ gave himself to save the world. Doesn't matter what color you are, where you're from, what you've done. Jesus Christ gave himself that you and I might have life everlasting. Amen? What good news that is, and it is for the world. So as we begin in the gospel today, turn with me to John chapter 12. Go to verse 12 of the gospel, and we're going to look at verses 12 through 19 to begin with. Jesus coming into Jerusalem. On the next day, much people that were come to the feast, when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, took branches of palm trees and went forth to meet him and cried, Hosanna, blessed is the king of Israel that cometh in the name of the Lord. And Jesus, when he had found a young ass, sat thereon, as it is written, Fear not, daughter of Zion, behold, thy king cometh sitting on an ass's colt. These things understood not his disciples at the first, But when Jesus was glorified, then remembered they that these things were written of him, that they had done these things unto him. The people, therefore, that was with him when he called Lazarus out of his grave and raised him from the dead, bear record. For this cause the people also met him, for that they heard that he had done this miracle. The Pharisees, therefore, said among themselves, Perceive ye how ye prevail nothing? Behold, the world is gone after him. Keep your Bible open. But as we consider this passage of Scripture, Palm Sunday, we call this day of Jesus' arrival in Jerusalem, Palm Sunday. We celebrate that Sunday before Easter Sunday every single year. Palm Sunday, five days before his crucifixion. And in these five days... We balance how the dynamic and the personality of a crowd can change. On Palm Sunday, as we just read, we hear the joy that cannot be contained as people shout Hosanna. And yet, we also, five days later on Friday, many of the same people, not all of those, but many of those same people express an anger that cannot be silenced when they say 
crucify him. Very briefly, let me say that I believe that many of them were the same people. A crowd can be stirred up and changed in a very quick manner. For example, in Matthew's gospel, you don't have to turn there, just listen. Matthew chapter 27, verses 20 and 22, it says, But the chief priests and elders persuaded the multitude that they should ask Barabbas and destroy Jesus. Verse 22, Pilate said unto them, What shall I do then with Jesus, which is called Christ? They all say unto him, Let him be crucified. I believe that many in the crowd who welcomed him with a hosanna on Palm Sunday were also in the crowd stirred up by the religious leaders, and they too chanted, crucify him. The dynamic and the personality of a multitude of people can be changed very quickly. On Palm Sunday, why is there such joy as Jesus is coming into Jerusalem? Well, I do want you to remember that his ministry is at its apex. Its apex. It's at its highest point right now. People know about him. His greatest miracle on earth had been accomplished at this point. He had raised Lazarus from the dead. Remember, it was in a little community called Bethany, a mere five miles outside of Jerusalem. So here we are at the Uh, at the entry point of Jerusalem, Jesus is coming in, and these people know about, some of them have seen Lazarus and saw his resurrection, and joy surrounds this crowd as they're getting ready to welcome Jesus into the city of Jerusalem. I want you to think about this. While Bethany was five miles away from Jerusalem, Amherst Cemetery is only six miles away from us. If this past week someone had been resurrected from the dead at the Amherst Cemetery, The early service and the later service could not have contained all the people who would have been here. Amen? People were excited over the fact that Lazarus had been raised from the dead. So it was Jesus' day. He was the man of the hour. He was recognized highly, and as he enters the city of Jerusalem, people are lining the roads in the excitement of what Jesus had accomplished in his life. Just wanted to see him. Maybe they would have an opportunity to touch him, but they wanted to be there for him. And as they cry, Hosanna, it means save us or save now. If you want to write this reference down, Psalm 118, verse 25, the first two words in your English version, are saved now, but the word in Hebrew is Hosanna. So they're fulfilling the prophecy of Psalm 118. Their welcome is full of enthusiasm, and in fact, write this down if you're taking notes. This triumphal entry into Jerusalem on this Sunday is the biggest public celebration of Jesus' ministry in all of the Bible. The greatest celebration of Jesus as the Son of God is contained right here on Palm Sunday as we just read it. And although Scripture says nothing about it, you can be sure that the Roman government was watching Jesus coming into Jerusalem. Anytime that anyone would be proclaimed a king coming into the city, the Roman government was going to be watching them, worried about them, keeping an eye on an uprising through them. I'm sure the government was watching Jesus coming into Jerusalem. The religious leaders, those who hated Jesus because he pointed them out as fakes and phony teachers, they hated him as well. You can be sure that they were watching him coming into Jerusalem as all of this adoring multitude was surrounding him, but they hated him all the more. They devised the plan of how to stir up the crowd and how to crucify, how to murder him to get him off of the face of the earth. They sneer in John chapter 12, verse 19, the world, people from all over the world are coming to him in adoration, and he has to be stopped. This party has to be broken up. Jesus knew in the entry into Jerusalem on this Palm Sunday, Jesus knew that the welcome would be very temporary, that the joy and the hosannas would soon fade away. These people waving palms today, many of them in five days would be waving their fists. Well, we move on in Scripture. As Jesus comes into Jerusalem, He's going to spend the next five days in intense ministry before the cross comes. So, as we go on in Scripture here, we move on with a time stamp. This is important. Jesus came into Jerusalem on the same week as Passover. 
as the Jewish nation was celebrating the high holy day of the Jews, as they celebrate their release from slavery in Egypt and celebrate the Passover meal, Jesus is coming into town in that very season. That's not by chance, ladies and gentlemen. That was ordained by the very mind of God before the foundations of the world were laid. Jesus coming into Jerusalem on Passover, the Hebrew word is Pesach, the day that they remembered freedom. No one gives a greater freedom than Jesus Christ. And it comes through the cost of the cross. Jesus gives us freedom. Now, in this particular week, the population of Jerusalem multiplied as people from all over the world came to celebrate the Passover in the holy city of Jerusalem. So the city was bulging at the seams with people who had traveled in. Some of them were Jews. Some of them were out-of-towners who were Gentile. Well, as we move on in Scripture, John chapter 12, verses 20 and forward, a group of -of out-of-towners, non-Jews, they were Greeks, had wanted to see Jesus. And they come to the disciple Philip to see if they could get a contact through Philip to be able to meet with Jesus. Now, most likely, these were Gentile men, Greek men, who had converted to the Jewish faith. They were godly men. They were men who were seeking after the footsteps of God in their life. They had come to a genuine faith in God the Father, and they desired to meet Jesus. So here's John's account of that happening. Go with me to John chapter 12. Start with verse 20, and let's hear these words as John writes them under the inspiration of God. John 12, verse 20. And there were certain Greeks among them that came up to worship at the feast. The same came before, therefore, to Philip, which was of Bethsaida of Galilee, and desired him, saying, Sir, we would see Jesus. Philip cometh and telleth Andrew, and again Andrew and Philip tell Jesus. And Jesus answered them, saying, The hour is come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. He that loveth his life shall lose it. And he that hateth his life in this world shall keep it unto life eternal. If any man serve me, let him follow me, and where I am, there shall also my servant be. If any man serve me, him will my Father honor. Now is my soul troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour, but for this cause came I unto this hour. Father, glorify thy name." Then came there a voice from heaven saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. The people, therefore, that stood by and heard it said that it thundered. Others said, An angel spake to him. Jesus answered and said, This voice came not because of me, but for your sakes. Now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. And I, if I be lifted up from the earth will draw all men unto me. This he said, signifying what death he should die. The people answered him, We have heard out of the law that Christ abideth forever. And how sayest thou the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is this Son of Man? Then Jesus said unto them, Yet a little while is the light with you. Walk while ye have the light, lest darkness come upon you. For he that walketh in darkness knoweth not whither he goeth. While ye have light, believe in the light, that ye may be the children of light. These things spake Jesus and departed, and did hide himself from them. May God add his blessing to the reading of this precious portion of his word. As Jesus just comes to Jerusalem at the height of his popularity, all people want to meet him. All of them would love to have had a word with him or touched his garment in some way. And a group of Greek Gentile men are seeking after God, and they want to have a discussion with Jesus. They know there's something special about Him as the Son of God, as this miracle worker within this community. 
And the best way they know to get to Jesus is to ask a disciple of his, may we speak to him? So they approach Philip, first of all. Why Philip? Out of the disciples. Well, there's a reason Philip is approached. He is the one disciple who has a Greek name. This is a group of Greek men. So they perhaps found out the names of the disciples, and Philip had a Greek name, so he was the natural one to go to. But as Philip heard their request to see Jesus, he said, hang right there. Stay where you are. Let me go up the chain of command here and see if I can get you a meeting with Jesus. So then he goes on to Andrew, another disciple, and he said, those men over there, Andrew, those men, they want to speak to Jesus. Do you, do you think we can get that to happen? And so Philip and Andrew go as a team, and they take their request to Jesus about this group of Gentile Greek men who want to meet with him. Look at verse 23, John 12, 23. And Jesus answered them, meaning he answered Philip and Andrew as they were talking to him. The hour is come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Circle that word glorified. The hour is come that the Son of Man be glorified. This is important. The words of Jesus as he speaks in this passage are a reply to Philip and Andrew not to the group of Greek men. Scripture does not give us an account of what he says to this group of Greek men. I believe he did meet with them. They, they wanted to see him. I believe that he came and answered that request. But we don't have uh, uh, the Scripture to give us a foundation of what he says to them. But he did see them, and I believe he did meet with them. But Jesus acknowledges to Andrew and to Philip that his coming death on the cross is imminent. The hour is come. And he acknowledges them, to them as well that it's not just for a few chosen people. It's not just for a Jewish nation. It's not just for a certain color of people. It's not for a certain societal position of people. It's for all people. It's for all the world to come to know God the Father. His death would not be for a few. It would be for all. It'd be for all men, women and all men. It'd be for all boys and girls. It'd be for the rich. It would be for the poor. It'd be for the slave. It would be for the free. It would be for the Jew. It would be for the Gentile. It'd be worldwide. His death would be atoning for every sin of every person who would come to him in faith and in trust and belief. So as this group of Greek men stand there waiting, Jesus says to Andrew and to Philip, people of all sorts, and people of all kinds and all colors are seeking me. And my hour is now here. Remember, Jerusalem is filled with the world that day. People had come from all over the world for the celebration of Passover. So literally it was true that today we have the, we have the amazing ability to be seen by the world. But in Jesus' day, the world had come to Jerusalem, and so the world was seeing what Jesus was going to do. And when all of the world is watching, Jesus says, I will be glorified. Why is that an unusual word? Because in essence, what's going to happen, he could have said, and maybe in our minds he should have said, I'm going to be crucified. The hour is come that I'm going to be crucified. The cross was before him just days ahead. And yet he says glorified rather than crucified. If you really think about it, it's an unusual usage of the term. But Jesus is looking beyond the cross. Jesus is looking to what the cross is going to produce. Yes, he's going to be uh, crucified. But through the crucifixion, he's going to be glorified. So he's looking on the other side of the cross and the other side of his death to what it's going to produce. People are going to have the opportunity to be saved. He sees the outcome of the cross as he is glorified after the cross takes place. After the cross, beyond the cross, Jesus says, I will be glorified and it will be my joy to see men and women and boys and girls saved. The agony of the cross will produce the joy of forgiveness. You have to go through the doorway of the cross to come to the open door of forgiveness. But through the cross, Jesus will be glorified. Do remember this, as the human Son of Man, 
Jesus dreaded the cross. Jesus was anxious about the cross. Jesus dreaded the pain of the cross. Remember in the Garden of Gethsemane, as we will study it, he sweats blood. The weight of the cross is so heavy on his shoulders. And he even comes to his father and asks, Father, is there any other way for salvation to be accomplished? If you can spare me of this, Lord God, please do. Look at verse 27, John 12, 27. Jesus says, now is my soul troubled. By the way, the Greek root of the word troubled means extremely emotionally, physically troubled. He felt the weight of the cross on his shoulders. He says, I'm troubled. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. Spare me if you can. But... For this cause came I unto this hour. Father, glorify thy name. In other words, Lord, spare me if you can, but if you cannot, I am here and I'm present and I'm accounted for to go through this hour if it is what you desire. And he uses an illustration in verse 24. And we know it's important because it begins with the flag words that we've studied over and over in this Gospel of John. It starts with the words, verily, verily. Anytime you see Jesus say, verily, verily, truthfully, truthfully, truly, truly, I say to you, you better take note of it because it's a very important statement. He says, if you take a kernel of wheat, that seed is solitary and it is alone and it is of little usage. If you were to take that seed and use it for food, it would be just one crunch between your teeth and gone, and it wouldn't satisfy any hunger whatsoever. One little seed is alone and solitary. But if you plant that seed in the ground, it will die to its form as a seed, and a plant will flourish and grow from it so that others may be fed through the wheat of that plant. You have to invest the seed in the ground. You have to plant that seed in the proper soil so it can die to itself and grow into something bigger and greater and more productive than the seed itself could be. Here's what Jesus is saying. At the cost of the cross, I am planting my life. I am investing my life. And through my one individual death on the cross as the very Son of God, I can produce salvation for every person of faith in the world from the age before me to the ages after me. I can bring salvation and forgiveness to everyone who comes to me in faith, in truth, in belief. If I were to refuse the cross, Jesus said, my solitary life would be more comfortable. I wouldn't have to face the pain. I would not have to face the agony. I would not have to face the punishment. I would not have to face the emotional drain of the trial and the fakeness of it all and being carried to the foot of the cross and erected my feet, lifted off of the ground on the old rugged cross. I wouldn't have to bear it if I would say no to the cross. But if I did that, Millions upon millions, even numbering into the billions of people, would be hopelessly lost and not have one opportunity to witness God the Father in heaven. If I were to refuse the cross, billions would be hopelessly lost. So here's Jesus' decision. Either save myself and let billions be lost or lose my life to the cross so I can offer salvation to every person on earth. And we know his decision. And then, and here's where it gets really important for you and for me. And then he applies that principle to us who believe him, who know him, who follow him. Look at verse 25 of John 12. This is an underliner. If you underline in your Bible, here it is. He that loveth his life shall lose it. And he that hateth his life in this world shall keep it unto life eternal. Hate here is the Greek word miseo. 
And it means to disregard, to lay aside your life and your needs as being entirely important. Lay aside your life so that you can look at the life of someone else with the eyes of Jesus. So you can look at the life of someone else and realize that he has a ministry for you to give them the love of Jesus Christ. So you look away from yourself to the needs of somebody else. That, in biblical terms, is hating yourself. Laying aside yourself so you can see someone else. Look at others as Jesus did. He says, you know, there are people, and here's his word here, his implication here. There are people who only concentrate on themselves. They're the center of their own existence. They're their own little God. I'm going to take care of me. I don't care about anybody else, anything else. I don't care where the church meets. I don't care about a biblical word. I'm going to take care of me. And Jesus says they're the center of everything they know. They are so self-centered. I'll build a mansion to house me. I'll save up every penny that I've ever made so I can spend it on me. I'll stockpile all the food I can in my pantry, in my storehouse, so I can take care of me. I'll only look after my comfort. I will live only for my well-being. I will only think about my pleasure and taking care of myself. Life is about me and me alone. I want my way. Forget everybody else. I want my way. And Jesus says, you enjoy that life for now. Because one day, and that day will come very soon, you will lose it. You better enjoy that life now because it's the best you'll ever have for all eternity. You will lose it. And it will never be restored to you again. Enjoy it now because it will dissolve away. On the other hand, praise God there's on the other hand. There are people who say, Lord God, through Jesus Christ as my Savior, I will live for you. I will look away from myself, and I will live for you. And when the circumstances demand it, I will live sacrificially for you. Help me, Lord, look beyond myself. Help me see that the world is bigger than my little sphere in it. Help me see others. Help me see needs. Help me see where I can be a minister, where I can give my talents to help someone else. Help me not be so self-centered that I miss reaching out to someone else. It might be a child around your table. It might be a spouse. It might be a family member. It might be a friend at work. It might be someone crossing the path of your life. Help me see them, Lord. Help me live the model of Jesus who gave himself who said, I want to be invested so the world can be saved. Lord, help me live with the attitude that I want to invest myself so someone else in the world can know you, can feel your love, can be provided for through your grace. Lord, plant my life, invest my life so I'm productive. I'm the seed. Now plant me, Lord, so that I can be productive to someone else. Life is not just about me. Life is leaving a legacy about the Savior whom we have have served. And we leave that legacy in the hearts of people. Take my one life, Lord, and make it productive in other people's lives. That's exactly what Jesus did. And he asks us to see him as the model that we invest our lives so others see Jesus in us and grow in him. You know, personally, when I depart the world, I pray that people think more about the Jesus that I serve than about my life. And I I pray you say amen to that, not for me, but for you. That that's the mindset that overtakes us. That we want to decrease, increase in us. And that we want to leave a legacy not of who we are, but through us who Jesus is. So that we leave the footsteps, even when we're gone off the face of the earth, that someone else can follow to follow Jesus. Life is not about us. It's about Him when you're a believer in Him. Now, as Jesus speaks these words, He's the suffering servant. He's ready to face the cross. And in Scripture, John chapter 12, verse 28, God speaks from heaven. 
Look at verse 28, an interesting verse. John 12, 28. If you have a red letter Bible, you see the words that Jesus speaks. Father, glorify thy name. In essence, he's saying, through me, glorify thy name. Now, the letters go to black letter, but this is God the Father from heaven speaking. Then came there a voice from heaven saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. God the Father is pleased with the investment that His Son is going to make for the salvation of the world. And the people of Jerusalem that day heard the voice of God. Some of them thought it was thunder. Some of them thought an an angel spoke out of heaven, but it was the very voice of God. And here at this point in Scripture, Jesus now, He's been talking, as we've talked about, he's, He's been talking to Philip and Andrew. Now, He's opening up His words to the entire multitude surrounding Him. Not just the Greek men, but to the entire multitude surrounding Him. He's speaking to the crowd now. Look at verses 30 through 32. Jesus answered and said, This voice came not because of me, but for your sakes. Now is, the ju- now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out, and I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. Jesus tells the multitude His feet are going to be lifted off of the ground of the earth by the old rugged cross. The cross is coming. The hour is now. And he's telling the crowd. So through the cross, forgiveness is going to be won and Satan is going to be defeated. That's Jesus' words. Look at the last verse that we study today, verse 36. Jesus says this. Here is the invitation of Jesus Christ. While ye have light... Believe in the light that ye may be the children of light. Jesus says, the light of God is here among you. Now is the time to come to me. Now is the time to profess me as Lord and God and Savior. Today, listen, please, if you do not know Jesus as Lord and Savior, if you're listening by streaming today, if you're on an FM signal in a parking lot, or you're sitting right here in person in this church, if you do not have a relationship with Jesus today, He is inviting you to come through this verse. He is the light of the world. And He is inviting you to come. I'm not asking you today if you've come to church. I'm not asking you if you're good. I'm not asking you if you know your Bible. I'm not asking you if you're moral. I'm not asking you if you're good to your neighbor. I'm asking you, do do you have a relationship, a saving, faithful relationship with Jesus Christ? If you do not, it is my joy to tell you that Jesus Himself invites you to come to Him. Because the cross has taken place. He has been glorified. And it is His joy today to offer you salvation. These are His words to you today. When He died on that cross, your name, your life was on His heart. And He knew you would need this invitation that you are hearing through His word this day. And you can come to Him and say, Lord, I believe. I believe on you. I believe what you did on the cross. I believe what you did at the empty tomb. And I want to be a child of God. I want to be your son or your daughter. And I want your honor and I want your glory forever as I stay by your side. Today is your opportunity to receive him as Savior. It doesn't matter if you're here in a church or you're sitting in your kitchen or you're in a car traveling somewhere. You can say yes to Jesus right now where you are. And the good news is he will receive you in a true relationship of faith. That is not my promise. I don't have the authority to give you that promise. That is his promise based on the authority of the cross. And he invites you. He invites you today. He invites you this moment. He doesn't ask you to wait. He doesn't tell you to get your sin in check. He doesn't tell you to become a Bible scholar. He says, come now. Come today. I want a relationship with you. I want you as my son or my daughter. Come now. He was hated by the world so you could know the love of God. If you need him, this is the moment. Wherever you are, this is the moment. He's waiting. Don't wait another minute. Church, Christians, 
Not done yet. Listen, here's your part of this. If you're a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, continue to listen here. These words should change our entire outlook of life. When we come to Jesus as Savior, the church is not built by Jesus that you and I might be comfortable. Praise God today, the air conditioning just came on, I heard it. The pews are good and soft. We are comfortable here, but that's not what Jesus created the church for. He created the church that He would take us from this place as His people into the world of lost people that they can come to Him through our witness. Amen? So that is a life of sacrifice, and that is a life of giving, and that's a life of laying aside what I want to do so I can be who Jesus wants me to be and how I am to serve Him and invest my life and plant my life that He can make produce something productive through me and from me. The church directs us to look beyond our needs and see the needs of a world hurting and lost and hell-bound. We are to feed the hungry. We are to support the missionary. We are to be open if He calls us to go, to go. We are to reach the fatherless. We're to help the hurting. We're to reach those who are different from us. It doesn't matter what color they are. It doesn't matter what social standing they have. Jesus says, reach them. He modeled it for us. We saw Him reach all When we see a need, we're to do something about it. Most importantly, when we see lost people, we're to take Jesus to them. If we, the church, look out only for our comfort, we have fallen into grave sin. If we look at only taking care of ourself, we've fallen away from the Word of God. We've fallen away from the commission of Jesus Christ upon our lives to model Him. The church was not created for comfort. The church was created for commitment. And that's my final word to you today. Who of us will commit our lives, believers, who will commit our lives that we will take Jesus in the world this week? That's what he did. And now it's what he calls us to do. Will you commit your life to live for him this week to come? I pray that we join our hearts and our minds and our commitment together to live for Him. And today, if you need Him as Lord and Savior, He is more than willing and He is waiting to receive you as His son or daughter in a relationship of love if you come. Church home, whatever you need, He meets us. Let's pray. Father God, these words are words of tremendous challenge, and yet, Lord, thank You that You modeled what a true life should be invested in the kingdom of God. You said, my hour has come. Well, today, here's the hour we worship. And this is the hour that we come and say, Lord, we are committed to serve the Jesus who gave his life that we might be saved. Help us, Lord. Take us into the world. Show us the opportunities and the appointments that we have this week to share the love of Christ. Bless this church, I pray, Father. Help us not simply look at ourselves. Help us look outside of ourselves to the glory of Jesus Christ for others. Bless that one who needs you. May he or she come. Bless us as we worship together and as we commit our lives to you. In Jesus' name, amen.